All right, we don't have too, too much time left. I do want to make sure we get to Josh in Colorado because Josh seems to have an interesting thing and he's been waiting for a while. Um, Josh, welcome to the show. Hey, V, how's it going? What's up, Eric? Hello, hello. I'm going good. What can we help you with today? What's on your mind? What's on your minds? Well, first off, I just uh, wanted to tell you that uh, I was on the back cruise with you guys last time there was a back cruise. And hey! Hey! And, and so, and uh, V, actually, you and I walked from the back cruise to Esther's Folly and chatted a bit. So oh, cool. I remember it's you. Great. Yeah. Cool. Hi. How nice. are you doing, man? Yeah, <laughs> nice. pretty, pretty good. Anyway, um, so yeah, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about with you guys what you think about um, Julian James's uh, theory of the bicameral mind and the origin of consciousness. And if you've never heard of that and if it's just a thing you don't care about or where you guys are at on that. Yeah, so um, I know very little about it. I've heard it before, and I'm pretty sure it's it's speaking about... Uh, there's This is a really weird, like, path to go down. There's a... There is a... Um, a, a... A fairy tradition in a specific stream of American witchcraft that talks about your three-part soul, and it's your mm. talker, your fetch and your godhead, I believe, are the, the three, or the god self. So there are three parts okay. of your soul. And the, there's, a, there's the part that is the talker, which is the one that engages with other people and says things and is that, like, conscious presence. There's the god self that kind of hovers around the top of your head. Um, and that is kind of your your higher self, your, your ego, I suppose. And then the fetch is the funnest part. The fetch is the part that you can transform into an animal and go make do errands for you, which is fun. Um, <laughs> so I, it's, it's a fascinating belief system and it's super interesting. And that's the first thing that came to my mind when I was reading about this because I believe it's a similar concept of like your mind being split into kind of the listener and the speaker. Is that kind of accurate? Um, I would say that that's kind of accurate. The The difference between what you just described though is like that's a, a belief that people currently hold about our, our the way our brains work now mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, the epoch it's that it used to be that we our two halves of our brain were not connected and needed to use audio hallucinations from the right side to the left side to um, inform the your your isn't as conscious as ours is now uh, of of things that are out of the ordinary. So like you could you could hoe the fields, you could milk the cows and do all the things that were normal in, with your regular bicameral mind, but as soon as something out of the ordinary came along, the subconscious part would communicate with the I'm going to put air quotes, but you can't see them, conscious part or waking mind, um, and to let it know how to deal with it. And that was often heard in the voice of someone you held in authority. So it would be like the chief of your tribe, or it would be the, the chief of your tribe would have a god. And when uh, and, and that's all like fun to talk about. And this is, this is where the, uh, the god idea comes from, because people actually were hearing a voice that was the voice of someone they considered to be an authority. So the idea of there not being a god would have been insane because everybody could hear their voice. <laughs> but he, so he's saying that uh, we developed the connections between the two halves the, um, that allow us to do all that internally and created introspection. And that's where he defines the difference between the origin of consciousness and the bicameral mind is the ability to introspect in a way that allows you to imagine the future better and the past and also create um, contingencies for imagined scenarios like we do now. Okay. I mean, that last part sounds reasonable. I don't know so much about the first part, but a lot of science way back when and a lot of philosophy and all of these, these fields of studies when they were newbies really did come down to let's make something up that explains what we're seeing and then hope it's hope it hope it works functionally in in our ability to to live better. So if somebody was like, oh, we're noticing that people, you know, have these two sides to them. Maybe they're different parts of the brain, and maybe the way that they communicate is like this. So like, it seems to follow a very familiar and, and established pattern of of initial people discovering in quotes a thing and deciding this is how it was, right? Like, uh, there are the four humors, or bloodletting cured everything. And then 
as we get more and more refined and, and can see more and more about the human body and about neurology and how we work, things become a lot clearer and we might take some of those concepts and apply them because they're familiar. Um, but I don't know, I guess, I guess I'm wondering, if, is, there, is there a question here? Uh, because I wanna make sure that I'm answering it if you're asking something. Otherwise, I think no, it's no. an interesting theory that we have found a reason to reference in modern medicine. Oh, for sure. This doesn't really um, go into any type of modern medicine. It's really more of a, a theory for the development of the human mind. Um, and I guess the que I don't really know that there's a question other than if you guys had ever heard of this and if you think it has any validity. Um, the reason I the reason I'm interested because I do consider myself a skeptic and an atheist and I do like evidence and so I don't I don't hold this as a belief of this is how it went because it's clearly unfalsifiable. But in the book The Origin of Consciousness in the and the breakdown of the bicameral mind. He goes through a really lot of evidence, both historical writings about the way the mentality of the characters in the book, specifically the Iliad, was compared to later writings, uh, hmm. the way society started um, to, to not be uh, as um, warlike. Like, they would sure fight over stuff, but like the idea of going and, and wiping out entire civilizations wouldn't occur to a bicameral man. It wasn't until the consciousness. And he, he points to the Assyrians. Um, and then it goes on to show psychological evidence that shows examples of people with um, a severed corpus colostrum or bipolar disorder, or not, I'm sorry, not bipolar disorder, um, multiple personality disorder, and how sometimes the separation of these two uh, halves of the brain result in these audio hallucinations that inform the, the waking mind. I don't know. I guess my question is, have you ever heard of that and do you think it's interesting and maybe if, it, if you do check it out but it, it kind of for me makes me feel a little bit better about why everybody's so obsessed with god and meeting god and why we have like some need to like search for a god even though like it could also be put down to our need to know why things happen you know but th this is an interesting thing yeah it also goes in the book goes, goes into when the minds separate or when it came together how people were yearning for that old ability to talk to their gods hmm. and went around and, and things like oracles and things like that were, became very popular you so know what I mean? and the, so, the yeah. interesting thing for me reading books like this i've read not this one and maybe i should um but i've read many books that try and take a sociological kind of observational perspective and say hey we're noticing mm -hmm. all of these you know, strange phenomena, and, and, and this is when this thing started, and this is when this thing stopped happening, either in society or in individuals, and let's propose something that maybe makes it all cohesive, and that's fun, and it's definitely, until we prove otherwise, a an option, I suppose, but I would I would never say that this was something, like, in general, like I, I read, I, I listened to an interview that Seth Andrews did with somebody and for the life of me, I can't remember the dude's name, but essentially his theory was that the reason that we think there is a God is because that is the last memory that we have of being in our, our, our parents' womb. And that sense of hearing a voice kind of in the dark and being protected and being safe and having this other person kind of like being the thing that keeps us alive is the only leftover part of that experience and we've just rationally interpreted that as oh well there must be a big parent who is bigger that i am in and that speaks to me kind of in the dark and so again like it, it's very interesting and it's a cool hypothesis but there's really no way to determine whether or not that's accurate. It's a cool story and it makes right. people exactly. cool story, bro, right? Like it makes people realize, right. oh, maybe there are other reasons for the thing that I'm feeling that is grounded in science and in nature and in history. And that's an important realization to make, but that's kind of where that line of study stops for me. You know, like once it gets us to that point of, oh, that's super cool. Maybe there are natural explanations for this. I should do more research. That's kind of it. Right. You know? Yeah, that, that, I, I totally agree with you. Like I, I've always, after reading the book, I was like, wow, that, that, that's some good answers to some questions. I wish it was falsifiable. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? That exactly. Was, that, was, that was where I came to. <laughs> yeah. Though I would point out that um, both Dan Dennett and um, 
uh, Hitchens, not Hitchens, the other guy. Uh, Harris? Uh, the one they made fun of on, on, on South Park. Uh, they both have referenced it in their books, too. Um, the guy who married Mr. Slave, no, Mr. I don't know, I'm losing my name. But, uh, uh, Mr. Garrison. But yeah. Yeah. Mr. Garrison, yes. And it was, uh, it was Dawkins. That's yeah, cool. Dawkins and Dennett both have Dawkins. proven themselves not experts in areas outside of their specific expertise recently. So I'd take that oh, with a grain of salt. But yeah, I think it's a it's an interesting theory. Um, but I think the main takeaway here, if I was going to find one, is there could be very rational, natural, historical, sociological reasons for the things that feel intuitive and natural to us that we would attribute to a god or a spirit or a soul. And we should go find those things as much as we can and hold loosely to them so that if something is disproven, we can let it go. Speaking of letting go, Josh, uh, thank you so much for calling us. We are going to need to move on to the next hey. caller, but it was lovely hearing from hey, you again. V, v, would it be possible for me to say the YouTube thing? The YouTube thing? Don't forget, yeah, the smash that like button. Oh. Don't forget to subscribe. Oh, Hit yeah. the bell and follow Skeptic Generation. Absolutely do that. Thank you so much, Josh. <laughs> I remember Josh. I think Josh and a couple other people ended up, we ended up going to Jamie's house. We detoured and and grabbed some beer <laughs> before okay. jumping to the, uh, we like a little pre-gaming. A little pre-game. We all crammed into his tiny little car and like, mm -hmm. yeah, it was good. It was a good time. Nice. Um, I, 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 I didn't really look into the bicameral mind until I started watching Westworld. Yeah. 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 That was oh, a really good God. show. Yeah.